Derek invited me to show off Baseball Mogul, which I'm happy to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want yes. to turn it into a hour long sales pitch, though. So uh, I, I'm, I'm. I think with your history, Clay, I think you're going to get lots of questions because I'm going to introduce you here in a minute. All right. And uh, like I said, it uh, we're at 502, so I think we'll start. <clears throat> we are being recorded. Uh, they seem to do this all the time so we can share with others later. So uh, um, be good boys and girls and watch your language. Uh, <laughs> I know I'll probably forget, but uh, the rest of you, you know, you can remind me. So tonight we got Clay Dresluck. Um Clay has... Uh, from some of the research I did, definitely could be called a pioneer in simula sports simulations. Um, I think baseball has been his biggest area, but he has also done, as from what I could find, some stuff on football and basketball. Um, he did his first, created his first dice and board game at the age of five, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure you might want to question some of that. And although he's done all this, I think the most fascinating game that he has created, uh, and I tried to find it today, and I wasn't really able to, uh, is called Emotion Impossible. And this is a simulation of sperm. So at that, I will now pass it off to Clay. Um, oh, I forgot. I am Mark Wendling. I'm co-chair of the group. And Derek's the other co-chair. He's... Uh, he does all the all the hard work, um, and he lets me do all the talking. So, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put myself on mute for a little bit and just hand it over to you, Clay. Uh, I'm gonna have to address the emission impossible uh, reference first. I think um, I don't know where you found that. <laughs> I was probably a senior in high school, 1988, an IBM PC XT, which I think was a PC with a hard drive was the XT part, had a 20 meg hard drive uh, and was writing things in Visual Basic. Um, and my friends sort of dared me to like write a game in half an hour. And I was like, I bet I can write a functional video game in half an hour. Um, by the end of half an hour, I had this weird thing where you were sort of this circle with a squiggle on it and you moved around and these blobs attacked you. Um, but we quick, you know, everybody decided it was fun. And so I added to it and it became this game where, okay, now, now we're going to get into some adult content. So there, it started with the ejaculation phase where you're traveling through the pathway before you enter uh, the, the height of the adventure. And during that, you're gathering uh, little protein globs. And so you do that. Uh, then it got to this point where there was a uterus and there's an IUD bouncing around that's trying to kill you. Um, it was very unrealistic. It was a lot of fun to play. Um, I think I released it as freeware and I told people to send me $15 if they liked it. And I got one $15 check. And so I was like, wow, I'm a professional game designer. Um, and then my girlfriend, who's now my wife, took it with her to college and she played it. And the and her roommate was like, her roommate basically decided to stop having sex with uh, with her boyfriend because she saw this and decided that it was a realistic depiction of what was going on. And if sperm are that strong that they can break through condoms and so on, then she didn't want any part of that. So that's the reference to Emission Impossible, which uh, definitely I thought was quite a clever game. Uh, but luckily I was able to get into sports games after that, which paid more than $15. <laughs> well, um, I'll have to start somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if people want a quick bio. I mean, there's a long list. After that, I uh, I went to Wesleyan University where I majored in uh, economics and mathematics, which is sort of what they called computer science at the time, um, was a subfield of mathematics. Uh, and I was lucky enough to stumble out of that, move across country. Actually, so my wife, Dee, um, was my girlfriend with me the whole time there and she knew someone at a company called Stormfront Studios in spring of 1993 and they had a game called Rebel Space that was running on um, America Online no it was running on Prodigy I think um, and they needed someone to sort of do customer support for that and she'd been spending the last four years playing online games like MUDs and she got hired for that job um, I followed her out. I had no idea I would work at this company, but uh, within a couple months, uh, there was a company outing 
to an Oakland A's game. I got talking with Don Daglow, who was running the company. He got he brought me in for an interview. Um, and I think the interesting part about the process of interviewing at Stormfront to eventually work on the Tony La Russa games um, was that I was going up against a lot of people coming out of Berkeley and Stanford with computer science degrees. Uh, but one of the interview questions during the uh, during the process was, was, OK, you're the shortstop and there's one out and there's men on first and third and you get a hard ground ball. What do you do? Uh, and I had to sort of think. I didn't actually ask if the infield was in or anything at the time, but I just sort of said, well, do I have time to get the double play? Because if not, then I'm going to throw home. And I was sort of the only person among all these geniuses they were interviewing that knew enough about baseball to like, under, you know, to answer that reasonably well. Um, so anyway, if you've got grandkids out there and they're, you know, people are telling them they're too involved in baseball, it, it will sometimes help them get jobs, especially if it's baseball related. Um, but so that worked out well. Um, I was at Stormfront for a couple of years, worked on Tony La Russa. I think we called it 2.5. It was sort of a 1994 upgrade and then Tony La Russa 3, um, tail end of Tony La Russa 2, uh, old time baseball and the beginning of Tony La Russa 4, I think it was called. Um, right. I don't know if it had a different name. Uh, old time baseball came out between 3 and 4. Derek probably has all the stuff memorized. <laughs> yeah, Tony La Russa 4 was the last one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was gone by then, and and in the in the last few months I was there playing, uh, working on old time and working on three. Um, I saw this pretty cool single season simulator and said, you know, it'd be very cool if you could just play for ten years and, you know, trade players at the end and draft players and so on. Um, Don didn't want to add that to the game, and I'm sure that was a perfectly reasonable. Um, option considering the resources he had and what he knew about the market and the fact that he was making money from you know Sega games and things that where that kind of aspect wouldn't work well but it meant that when I left um when I left Stormfront and moved back to Connecticut uh I started programming a game called Baseball Mogul um and according to the comments in my code that was about two weeks after I got married that was late 1995 um and my wife was working for Grolier Interactive which was a game company uh and that's only important because she uh was making $35,000 a year and she used that to support me for the year and a bit that it took me to make that um so anyway that was the 90s baseball mogul came out um and by came out it means that I tried to shop it to several publishers uh nobody really bit and so we bought an 800 line and um started selling it ourselves. Um, I guess the rest is history. Uh, are, would people here like to take a look at the current baseball mogul to at least have some I, idea what I'm talking about? Sure. I would All say, right. yeah, yeah, that I guess that was one of my thoughts. Yeah, if you can share your screen and just, you know, go, go through some of the highlights of, of how you would, you know, maybe play through, uh, you know, but set it up and, and play through a, a few games or a season, how, how you yeah. would go about doing that. Uh, let's see, share screen. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Can Mark figure that out? Yep. Yeah, there's gotta be a button for that. <laughs> oh, it looks like I got it. Okay. Um, screen two. Here we go. Yeah, I made you a co-host, so don't do anything bad. <clears throat> oh, awesome. I won't. I don't know what I could do. Kick people out? <laughs> I really don't know what you could do either. Um, I'm already in trouble for telling the story. All right. It says I'm screen sharing. So yep. Yeah, I can see it. We have, I had actually just started a game uh, with the 2003 Red Sox here. I'll actually go back. Um, sure. So this is what you get when you start Baseball Mogul. Uh, Baseball Mogul 2022 was released um, in April of last year, and I'm working on a new version now. Um, the biggest change every year is that I add, is that I update the stats through, um, through the most recent season. Uh, for a while, I had been using the Lawman database, but that's not really updated promptly anymore. So I've sort of created my own version of the Lawman database, which involves uh, some scraping and some ham copying from 
uh, I get lefty righty stats from fan graphs. I get uh, pitcher batter fielder from um, from baseball reference um, generally and update the stats. And and then I usually have to spend a week finding out like what data is screwed up. For example, uh, baseball reference once changed the uh, user ID for Kevin Euclid. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but uh, it used to be Y-O-U-K-I-K-E derived from his name. But if you pronounce that, it's um, an insensitive word. And so they changed it, which is great, but it meant that like I had to figure out why Kevin Euclid wasn't showing up when I started the game. Um, so anyway, secret part, everybody sort of thinks that it's easy to just update stats, but you always spend time wrestling with, oh, this format changed and this ID changed and, and you do those things. So in this case, I want to start a new game. Um, does anybody have a year they would like to start in? All right. I know everyone's muted. I'm going to do 2003 again because I want revenge for Aaron Boone. Um, And right now it's chugging all the stats. Um, luckily, that's not too time consuming. And then I'm going to pick the Red Sox again. So it lets you pick uh, different teams. Um, if you're familiar with baseball games, you will notice that these are actual team logos here. Uh, most companies need to pay money in order to get team logos. I would have to pay money to get team logos. We are not officially licensed by Major League Baseball. We're not endorsed by Major League Baseball, but we have some cool code in the game that if you have an internet connection, it goes online and finds uh, player photos and team logos and downloads them. So I think the screenshots of the original game before you install it include sort of these generic things that say Pittsburgh, which we supply, um, but it's actually not that hard to get it updated uh, with some things that look better. All right, so it looks like I'm gonna be playing Pittsburgh in this case. Um, and we have a dumps you at, at a headline. I'm Clay Dresslock. I've become the uh, general manager for the 2003 Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, and so it creates one story uh, about what's happening so far. Picks a player, Brian Giles, who it thinks is key to my success. And I click scouting. I can see Brian Giles scouting report. Um, we have ratings in a number of areas. These are fielding ratings. So he's an, it's a generally sort of a 50 to 100 scale like you might get in, uh, in school um, with 80s generally being very strong and, and weak. So if you put Brian Giles at shortstop, uh, he'll be a 53. So very close to the lowest possible number. Put him in center, he'll be a 64, be a little better than, a little better than he is in the infield. Uh, but basically he's a left fielder. Um, you see his year-by-year -year stats here, uh, fielding stats. I don't know if you want to get a look at what I supply. We include catching stats if he's a catcher. Uh, this is calculating defensive runs above average, and then this is defensive wins, uh, which you see sort of hovering around zero as he's an average fielder. Um, batting stats there, has no career pitching stats. Um, and we do have minor league stats loaded for him. Uh, so these are the, the purpley pinkish ones here are playoff stats. Uh, so yeah, so at the age of 27, he had seven games in the playoffs uh, before that. So we have three years of playoff stats when he was with Cleveland. Then unfortunately he moved to the Pirates who were not in the playoffs. Uh, we have his... Um, Anyway, we have his uh, minor league stats. Um, and in this case, I'm going to play until opening day. So the game starts on March 1st, which is just sort of gives you time to, you could go out, you could sign players from the free agent pool. In fact, let's take a look at that. Uh, players, free agents. So these are the players that I think were not on a roster at the start of 2003. Um, so I could say that I need a second baseman. Uh, you know, look at these guys here. I can rank them. So again, we have the overall rating scale and then we have a peak rating scale. So the younger guys on the list um, have a difference between their current number, 81, and their, uh, their peak's gonna be an 85. Uh, column headings lets you change what stats you're showing. 
So I could add uh, OPS and slugging, and I also want to see walks. And now we see those are all added here. Uh, it's expandable. Um, so, you know, done, done a fair amount of work on the interface. This is currently showing this season stats because it's the beginning of the season, there's no stats. But if I click, uh, well, let's see, last season, these guys. All right. Most of these guys, I think, are minor leaguers. Uh, but like Pedro Castellano and BJ Serhoff actually have some stats, 170 home runs, and he is, uh, let's see, he's probably, he's 38, so that's why he's a free agent, because um, he's on the tail end of his career. So in this case, I've gone to opening day, haven't signed anyone, uh, go to my lineup. Um, here I can hit, click sort all and ask it to sort my lineup for me. I'm sort of looking at last season stats. Uh, projections are, it's my own formula, but it's a little bit like Zips or Davenport or something in that it, it weights stats from the last few seasons. Uh, so here we have, you know, Giles is projected to hit 285 with 31 homers based on his recent stats. So I can look at projections. Um, let's see if I change to projections versus lefties, I see that he's, um, he's a lefty. So he's projected to hit nine points lower against lefties. Um, and obviously I would want to do that because I could, that's, this is the lineup versus righties. This is the lineup versus lefties. Uh, so you can set different lineups for lefties, righties, or you can say, use the same one, and then that grays that out. And then whichever lineup you set will get used for both. Um, so I've set my lineup and I'm just going to go to, so here you see, we can, uh, go to standing screen. Um, I'm just going to play a month because I'm going to sort of show off how fast the sim is. Um, at the end of the month, the Detroit Tigers GM, who's currently being played by this stock art woman, uh, would like to offer me a couple players for Jeff Supan. Uh, and I'm just going to say no thanks. Then she wants to offer me something else for Reggie Sanders. I'm going to say no thanks. This guy from the Expos. Um, so if I say let's talk, it opens up the trade screen. Uh, and here I could... Uh, I could say, well, I don't want to give you Jeff Supon. So I remove him from the list by double clicking and then I submit the offer. Uh, and they say, well, without Supon, it's it's not great. So here, for those who can't see the screen, it says, if I accepted that deal, they would stick me in a rubber room. So this guy's not a fan of the deal. Uh, I go back and I'm not dealing with trade offers anymore, but I am a month into the season. I'm eight and 11. Uh, I can look at the calendar screen and see the individual scores. Uh, first game of the season, lost to the Expos, so on. Um, so I lost, it's, 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 uh, sure, Pirates Braves on the 27th, if I click on it, it will actually open. Can you see that? So that's the box score uh, that gets brought up when I click on the game. Um, so we have those options there. And then if I want, I can say, I would like to pick one of these games. Uh, we have here that on the 30th, I'm gonna be playing, um, you see when I move over, the projected starters lights up on the bottom. So the projected starters are D'Amico versus Maddox. That sounds like an interesting game. So I'm gonna right click it and then I'm gonna, or actually I could just click it and it will simulate until that game and play it in play by play mode. Uh, and so here we have the interactive part of the game. Um, so as you've seen, you can play a month in like three seconds, depending on how new your computer is. Uh, you can play a season just as quickly, um, or you could decide to play every pitch of every game. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm in manager mode, which is one click per bat, or I can go in player mode where I pick each individual pitch. Um, so in player mode, I can choose a fastball and decide where it goes. And then we have some... Uh, you know, I'll call them uh, classic style animations. These are not fancy 3D renders, um, but we've got pictures of a number of stadiums. Uh, people can add stadiums. I don't have a lot of the older stadium art, so I'm still working on assembling it, uh, but there are also uh, ways obviously for people to add them. Um, I can go into manager mode, at which point it just goes down to one per bat. Um, ooh. All right, I got a hit. Uh, my player is here, he's rounding first, and I have the chance to stretch it into a double, and my coaches are telling me I've got a 40% chance of 
being safe if I try. But of course, I'm going to try because this is a demo. Uh, we see these safe at second. So now we have Robles up here, uh, safe at second. And I can continue to play. Um, so one click per bat is this mode right now. If I do this, I can skip in at bat. If I do this, I can skip the whole inning. Uh, and so if we look at the box score in the upper left here, uh, I scored three runs in the first, one in the second, and so I could keep doing that. If I wanted to, I could just sort of, I could do this and say, oh, I'm going to wait till the game is close. So yeah, so now it's the bottom of the ninth and I'm up by a run. Um, and my pitcher is tired. So I go here and let's see. Um, my closer is Vogelsong, who is not doing great this year with an ERA over 12, but I'm still going to put him in. So I click replace. And now we have Brian Vogelsong on the mound. Um, and then I can try that. And he gives up a hit. So I'm going to actually just click finish, finish the game. It'll simulate it. And do, do, do. I get another trade offer because that always happens. And if I go back here, we see I, run, I won the game four to three. So anyway, normally I pay a lot more attention, but I don't want to I don't want to slow that uh, down for you guys. Uh, so we've got the calendar screen. Uh, this little head to head button brings up the head to head record uh, between all the teams. So I can see, uh, you know, oh and one against so I am. Anyway, you've seen a. You can probably figure that graph out. Um, calendar. Clay, one thing. One thing I was going to mention, Clay, is the. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you if you selected the option before you started this uh, particular replay, but I know there's the fictional versus the historical rookies aspect. Yeah. Um, um, let's see. So yeah, one of one of my one of my favorite parts of this is the amateur draft. So I don't know if you want to skip ahead to that. Well, I can do that here. Yeah, so I can go play until amateur draft, and as we know, it sims pretty quick. Um, tells me that the amateur draft is occurring on June eighth, uh, and it jumps to the screen, and we're already nine picks in or something because I'm not, I didn't get the first pick. Um, and here we're using real players. So these are these are. Uh, basically players who turned 18 in this season. Um, and then if I go to the amateur draft, I can, this is sort of a, I can look at my own guesses of what their current ratings are and what I think they're going to be. So it thinks Jonas Cespedes is going to peak at 95, but right now he's a 17 year old center fielder who's only 72, but uh, the 95 looks pretty good. And I know a little bit about baseball. So I actually know he's probably going to turn into a pretty good player probably can say the same thing about David Price, Josh Donaldson, uh, who is a catcher when he's 17. Uh, so that's interesting stuff. Obviously, we do have the defensive spectrum. Uh, players, if they have minor league stats saying they were catchers or infielders when they were young, they will they will have that position in the draft. And then, um, and then you can move them to other positions uh, if they don't do well at that, at that spot. Um, so I think that's a good example. So if I pick... I'm going to pick David Price. Uh, the other 29 teams pick, and then now I have to pick the second pick of my draft. It puts me back in this list, and now I can uh, see who's still available. Cespedes is gone. Um, <laughs> Carlos Gonzalez is pretty good. Uh, and that's an example of that. And then if I don't want to go through, it's actually only seven rounds because um, I don't have... Actually, I shouldn't say, I do have a lot of people in the database, um, but I think it would be sort of tedious to spend 50 rounds drafting people, most of whom aren't going to play. Um, so it takes players with major league experience or significant minor league experience and puts them in the draft. And so you have a, let's see what the list is here. You have 308 players to choose from, uh, which is a more manageable number. Um, and so you can go through... Mitch Moreland just drafted him. Now I'm in the fourth round. Or you can say play. Uh, in this case, I just say play one day. And it says if you want to play the next day, the computer will make the picks for you. So I do that. And now we can see I'm back at the calendar. We do have a finances screen. Um, 
because that is a significant part of the game, doing things like setting ticket prices, uh, obviously managing salary levels. Um, at the end of the season, you have contract negotiations and so on. Uh, so these factors play into that. Uh, Pittsburgh's revenue right now is 25 million. Oh, the 90s when revenue numbers were all below 100 million. Um, let's see. So the Yankees are at 60 million. Uh, but yeah, Pirates are down at 25. Um, and payroll budget says, based on my revenue and the amount of cash I have on hand, I should try to keep my payroll below 54 million. Um, and then my actual payroll is 51. And if we go to, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Yep. And so as you simulate, the numbers will update there. Um, leaderboard. So these are showing the current. Uh, so Brad Wilkerson is leading the league right now. It is showing both leagues. If I wanted to show the National League, I could do that. Um, not any pirates on this list, it seems. <laughs> there we go. There's a pirate. Uh, so if you click on this, it expands the list, gives you a little more detail. Um, and then uh, in recent years, I've added uh, some nice uh, options here. So I could say uh show me the batting average leaders over the last three and a half seasons right and so now we're looking at career totals from 2000 to 2003 uh helton and walker are leading those obviously oh it looks like walker ended up on the yankees so obviously while i'm playing the other teams are trading with each other and you can turn that off if you want to sort of replay the real season more accurately or you can leave it on which is what i do here um and that obviously creates some uh interesting <laughs> interesting things going on uh we saw the headline screen when i started if we go back there we can see that there are a variety of things it talks about injuries does sort of uh interesting summaries of certain games uh if it was about a game you can click the box score or the game recap i'll bring up the game recap actually because that was so the box score screen i already showed you but this is an actual play-by-play um, so first play of the game was on a fastball with an OO count. So it was on the first pitch of the game. Someone got a single. Then we see the Pirates put on the hit and run. This was when I was doing the auto manager. So the, so when it was being simulated, the computer did that for me. Um, then in the next at bat, uh, Roblinks got on on an error by the shortstop. And then now we see over here, a little picture. We got runners on first and second. Um, and this is win percentage. Um, this actually looks a fair bit like the play by play you'll find at baseball reference for historical games. Uh, so you can watch which hits increased or decreased their uh, chance of winning throughout the game. And obviously, if you get down here, the win percentage is 100 at the end of the game. Um, uh, a different way of viewing your of viewing your team. So here we have you know my lineup, and then my bench, and then my minor league players. But if I want to see it by position, I click on depth chart down here, uh, and I see the Giles is obviously first on the depth chart. Steve Pierce is second. Uh, can get scouting reports for these players, um, different stats by position, those sorts of things. Um, and since I just clicked on left field, it's showing me my left fielders and their uh, current contracts. So Giles is making nine million. Pierce is only making twelve thousand until he reaches arbitration, which will be in two thousand and six, based on his current playing time. Um, but obviously, that can change a little depending on uh, how players are used. Playing time manipulation. Um, the transactions. We see that we have all the transactions from the draft. Um, so I can see those but I can also change it to uh, all right so we don't have any words yet um <laughs> injuries these are the injuries so far in 2003 um with an estimate of how long people out so the first injury of the season up here and actually I can go to my team my team didn't have any injuries that's good all right um anyway that gives you a good idea there's a lot of so Rich Harden at some point injured his wrist playing for Oakland on May 29th and if I go here um anyway in his transactions we can see the we can see the thing there so obviously there's a few different ways to look at the data uh this is the playoff screen of what the playoffs would look like as it says up here if the season ended today 
Uh, so it looks like the Red Sox and Yankees and A's and Royals would be in the playoffs in the American League. Um, and then if we go back to standings, we could click on the American League and see that the Red Sox are in first. The Yankees are the wild card and the A's and Royals are there. So it's got that right. Um, and then the wild card races. Uh, these are so Boston's not listed here because Boston's the division leader. Uh, got the wild card listed and a line showing. Uh, so this screen's gotten a lot more complicated over the years because baseball now has. Do they have seven playoff teams per league? I'm con I'm confused. Six. <laughs> 2020 really confused me. Um, but uh, but you can do the 2020 uh, eight playoff teams. You can do the current system of six. I think you can adjust it for seven. Um, and all that is in the league editor. So I go to the league editor, and down here we see the number of games in the playoffs. Um, <laughs> vision series. Oh, yeah, here we go. So four AL playoff teams. I could change it to eight if I wanted to. Uh, for the American League, but not for the National League, I could do both. Uh, and then if I go back to the playoff screen, we now see that if I finish a season out, we will have eight teams in the playoffs in the um, American League. So a lot of customization and the ability to handle all the different uh, wild card and not wild card formats we've had over the years. I um, think that's a pretty good summary. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, yeah, there's one in the chat right now, Clay, I'll read for you. Okay. Are the stat windows... Oh. Are the stat windows exportable to JSON, CSV, or other formats? Um, the scouting report, where do we go? So I'm looking at Abraham Nunez here, and I clicked his batting tab, and this little clipboard appears over in the right. Uh, so if I click on the clipboard, uh, copies the currently displayed stats to the clipboard, uh, and I can choose CSV or tab delimited. Um, I'm actually going to choose CSV. I pulled up Notepad and then I hit paste, and there we go. So you guys can see that info there. Um, so that's Nunez's stats. Obviously, so this is comma delimited. You could save it. You change the change the file ending to CSV if you wanted to open it in Excel. Um. And that's just for the tabs where the clipboard's available. So the uh, game logs doesn't have that option, uh, something to work on at some point. But the batting, fielding, and pitching by season do all have that option. Um, and then the sortable stats screen is a very useful screen. Um, and here, if you right click, you can say copy players to clipboard. And that does the same thing. So I come in here. And in this case, it's tab delimited. Um, but yeah, so there's a there's a few places where you can where the screens you see generally the sortable stats screen is really good for this. Uh, and then obviously one nice thing about that is you can say um, I just want to see pitching stats, and I only want to see pitchers, and then I want to see career stats, right? So now you've changed the stats that are available. Um, but if you wanted to see something specific, um, I don't know, earned runs is an actual number, not just ERA. So now it adds that. And now when you copy that, so yeah, short answer, uh, there's a fair amount of ways that you can copy things to the clipboard, um, to save a CSV or as text. So yeah, Matthew says, that's awesome. He's real happy with that. Uh, Warren's asking, uh, or says that he's been playing for about 20 years and he's wondering if we'll ever be able to play Negro League seasons or 19th century. Um, Negro League seasons, yes. Uh, 19th century is not something I've been working on much. Um, this version actually, I was able to get Negro League stats about a year ago. Um, and so I've put them in the game as uh as draftable rookies in years when those players are available um but i don't yet have the team data uh so you can't you can't start a game and say i want to play the uh 1943 uh national negro leagues i guess there were sort of two dominant negro leagues around then 
Um, anyway, uh, I'm making progress towards the uh, Negro Leagues being playable. Um, not so much for years before 1901. I think Bill James had a quote about 19th century baseball that he sort of didn't think it was real baseball. And I think I sort of have fallen into that. I realize it's interesting and in a product like this, it would be nice to have access to that. I do have the stats. So if you start in 1901, you will see uh, Cap Anson's 1890s stats, uh, but you can't you can't play a game with the 1891 uh, Reds. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Mick's wondering uh, if this is a solo game or can you play a season with another person owning a different team? Um, you can play a season with another person owning a different team. Um, one way to do that, obviously, so you can, so league editor, um, I can pick the, you know, Red Sox and up here it says who's controlling the team. We have one human controlled team and 29 by computer. I'm turning the Red Sox into a human team and I'm saying that Fred Smith will be controlling that team. And so now um, when I go to the Red Sox lineup, I can make changes uh moving players up and down the lineup but if i go to the tigers lineup i can't these things are disabled so now the uh the red Sox and the pirates are under human control um and so in that case you could select you could uh like you could play every game in play by play mode uh in this in this example you'd basically be hot seating right you take turns controlling your team um, or you could sit down and I could make some changes to, to my Red Sox rosters. I could sign some players and then the person I'm playing with could make changes to the Pirates. And then we could agree that we're going to simulate a week or even simulate a day and then update our lineups and do those things. So that's one way to play multiplayer. Um, the other way is a lot of people out there do run leagues where one person online will agree to, to run the league. Um, and then other people will sort of send in their info. Um, and for that, there are some tools. Um, I guess I haven't really set up that one. Anyway, um, everybody can run Baseball Mogul on their computer and they can make some changes to their team and they can export them as like a transaction file and then send that into the person running the league. And then they sort of, they process all that and it, and it updates lineups and makes those changes. And then, so then that one person will simulate the games and can send the, send the new save game file out to people. So you go here and you save the game. Uh, game file is about 10 megabytes. You can put it up on Google Docs or in an email and uh, or do it that way. So those are the two ways that, that people are doing it. Okay. Joseph's wondering, uh, once all the Negro Leagues in there, um, can they play in the majors or are they like separate files? Um, I haven't gotten to that point yet <laughs> okay. um i so i said that the that the data is there uh and i'm not sure how i'm going to present it when i get them integrated i will probably have well so right now um you can set it up so that they get so that they're part of the major league draft pool um so that's that's the default option i would like it so that I would like to have the ability to play the actual Negro League seasons. Um, although it's interesting, I think there might be more demand for just having the players and integrating them into the major leagues because unfortunately the Negro League seasons were, um, you know, they're more complicated, right? They didn't play as many games. They played different numbers of games. They were barnstorming. They had a week off at a time. Um, I mean, I can certainly build a simulation that plays that, but I think, uh, getting Negro League players into the majors is is more of an interesting what if scenario if that makes sense okay I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a question that I have um you know you've been involved in a number of games and I'm curious um because of some research I'm doing how many variables go into the algorithm roughly I mean obviously you know you, you may not know the number exactly you may go roughly into playing a game, playing a season? Variables. Um, I mean, I can, 
So, I, I mean, at one, at one level, the answer to that is sort of the number of stats you have available for the player, um, which uh, are sort of the, you know, are the stats that you see displayed, um, which are baseball card stats, essentially, right? Singles, doubles, triples, home runs, walks. Um, and when, and when a pitcher faces a batter, uh, the uh, the formula for figuring out generally what happens, and I say generally because there are defensive factors and so on, um, is pretty simple. If if um, if Barry Bonds hit a home run in nine percent of his at bats, then he's going to sort of enter the at bat having a nine percent chance to hit a home run. If he's facing Kurt Schilling and Kurt Schilling allowed sixty percent fewer home runs than average that year then that 9% will get reduced by 60%. Um, then there are park factors. Um, and then if the if the engine sort of decides, you know, so it'll, it will, it will add up. So it takes the number of homers, it basically subtracts 60% and has that number of homers, uh, figures out how many strikeouts they had, adjust that for the pitchers, figures out how many, uh, a stat I just call normal outs, outs on balls in play. Um, adjust that for the pitcher singles doubles triples uh walks uh wild pitches pass balls hit by pitch are all affected because we have those stats and so if uh if bonds got hit by more pitches than average which he did then he will of course have a higher than average chance of getting hit by a pitch um those are all adjusted for lefty righty stats uh lefty anyway um so, yeah so when i was <laughs> When I was talking to, uh, I'm a I'm a college instructor. When I was talking to some of the ones that teach uh, statistics to try to figure out how many iterations I had to run, I said, "Well, you know, I think the variables when you get into full seasons and the whole bit, um, it's a giant number closing close to infinity if you have a calculation for infinity." <laughs> and uh, I said I was thinking of running just the number of seasons that that baseballs had, which is 118. And they looked at each other and they said, 118 will give you the data you need. <laughs> okay. Because they, they, uh, they indicated to me, yeah, this to try to do this would be just unbelievably hard. Um, yeah. um, but I, I, I'm glad because at some point I would really like to present this paper and I know that's going to get thrown at me. So, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thankful for your answer. Um, Anyway, I don't see any any more messages in the chat. Any questions there? So we'll open it up uh, to everybody. Um, uh, all right. I was just thinking one thing that you reminded me of. So the thing oh, about these okay. menus is they have all these tools that I've added over the years that I forget about when I'm talking about things. Uh, so one is the output encyclopedia, which will um, which will create a, you know a team page telling how they did every season. Um, we have team history. So here we have the Mets uh, going back to, well, <laughs> we have the Mets in 61 and 60 and 58, which when they didn't exist. Um, but if you ignore that minor bug, uh, you can see that we have attendance data and this is the actual attendance data uh, going back and then it updates the attendance data. I don't have revenue and profit data for the teams going back. Uh, that would probably be pretty hard to find. Um, but the thing that you just made me think of is uh, something called a single season simulator. So I can go in here and I can say, I want to simulate the season. I'm actually already at August 10th. So it's basically going to simulate the rest of the season 10 times or like maybe three times. Um, and give me the, give me the total results from that. Uh, so here in the upper left, it's simulating. It's it looks like it finished the first iteration, um, but that's an interesting tool because you can you can uh, start a game in 2003. You can move Pedro to the Yankees, and then you can simulate the season a hundred times, and it'll tell you that you know on average the Yankees won 93.2 games and the Red Sox won 86.7 or something. So you can you can see how changes like that affect a team. Um, and in this case, I only did it three times, but if I go back to single season simulator, 
and I say view the results, it gives me this. So these are the average results for my three seasons. Um, and I only simulated from August because that's where the save game was. But we see that uh, the Yankees got to the ALCS three times in those three two seasons. Um, and winning the World Series. Uh, Royals did it once and the Mets did it twice. Uh, obviously, you get a lot, a lot more interesting data if you let it run longer. But that was just a quick example. Okay, I got a couple more questions that have jumped in here. Um, I'm I'm sure Korea is sitting on the Met somewhere um, with his bad ankle and everything. Um, come on, guys, that's funny. Okay, uh, Stevens asking when MLB teams run simulations to help set their lineups for games. Do clubs create their own software, or do they use commercial products? That is a really good question. Um... I exchanged a few emails with Brian Cashman in the early 2000s, and he was using Baseball Mogul. Um, I don't think he is anymore. <laughs> uh, that's that's the best I can offer you. Um, nobody has contacted me since then. I haven't, I don't know, I haven't actively sought consulting work or anything. Um, they probably write their own software, and it's probably... It's probably simpler in a way, um, right? I mean, I think they, well, I mean, they don't, I think they have a specific thing they want to test for, uh, you know, when they're when they're doing those things. Um, they could certainly use a tool like Baseball Mogul. Um, they could use, you know, other games out there too. Um, yeah, I, I, know it's, what the, I know at the Baltimore Convention, uh, yeah. One of the individuals that uh, uh, does some work for one of the teams mentioned they use OOTP. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I know some use commercial, but I know some also write their own. Yep. Yeah, I know um, uh, Tom Tippett worked for the Red Sox for quite a while. He wrote Diamond Mind. Um, I'm pretty sure they were using that for a bit, or at least uh, he might have customized a version of that for them. Yeah. So yeah, I have heard of that too. But, you know, as the, and I can't think of his name, the one gentleman uh, from the Orioles essentially said in his speech, you know, if teams aren't using it, they're crazy. Right. Right. If they're not using simulations, they're crazy. Um, so you figure there's probably 28 teams using it. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, after so many years of development, what's the thing you wish the game simulated that it does not yet? Um. It's funny, the first thing that, that jumps to mind is actually just getting more data and more leagues for uh, Negro leagues. I would love to be able to have uh, Japanese leagues and Korean leagues. Um, interestingly, God, I should, I should get you guys the data at some point. I think um, 10 to 20 percent of my sales are to uh, people in South Korea. And that's been true for 20 years. Um, even though I don't have Korean players, they very much have enjoyed this game. Um, I think uh, part of the lesson there is I've never had sort of a draconian um, anti-piracy system like you see on Steam or with other games or something. And so for uh, for for a while, um, and maybe even still so, uh, a lot of people in Korea pirate the game, play it for free, and then when they get to like it, they they buy it. <laughs> so, you know, piracy can help get your game out there. Um, you might have um, already answered this. Theodore is wondering, do you have, uh, do you or have you do any projection or work for any MLB teams? Mm -mm. I have not. Okay. Uh, when you simulate a season, this is from Tim. Uh, when you simulate a season, how do you handle pitchers if if it's not a secret? I don't think anything's really a secret. Is the question how how they perform, um, or is the question like uh, 
Uh, no, what I'm asking is, and I'm sorry, I can't make my camera work. Um, I'm sorry. For example, well, I don't want to hijack things here, but I, I simulate games and I use uh, transition state change probabilities. And one of the major limitations of what I do is I leave the starting pitcher in for nine innings, which of course is preposterous. And I'm just wondering how would your simulator handle uh, re necessary pitching changes that occur in a typical nine inning game? Oh, um or are you you're just doing blanket games as and not considering different pitchers yeah so when um let's see do, 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 do. team strategies um so i'm controlling the mets here and i can go to pitching and i can adjust so obviously when i'm when I'm in the game, pitch by pitch, as I showed you before, I can control everything that I want to. Uh, but when I'm simulating what you're talking about, uh, I can adjust on a team by team basis uh, how often they're pitching out, uh, how often they're sort of pitching around strategy. Um, and so that's a team by team issue. Let's see, pitching, pitcher use. There we go. Um, and then these are some of the settings for um pitch counts so starting and short rest will decide you know how often it might jump to basically a four-man rotation if the if the uh you know so if i increase that i'll have the fifth guy getting skipped and jumping to the start of the rotation more often if i go down uh it'll generally stick to a five-man rotation uh and then oh, you can set it so are you are you leaving the starting pitcher in for the whole game though uh, no, so the so the AI is still deciding when to uh, pull the pitcher based on how many pitches they've thrown and their performance and so on. Oh, okay. Yep. So pitch through trouble means um, I don't pitching through trouble means I don't care as much how many runs they've allowed. I just care about the pitch count, right? Yep. So if it's the third inning and someone gives up seven runs, if you set this high they'll leave him in because they'll say, well, he's not tired yet. He's just having a bad day. Um, and then if you lower it, then he'll be more likely to have a quick hook. And then the pitch counts sort of adjust the overall pitch count. And then, oops, sorry, pitching. Um, strategies. So you can do that on a pitch on a pitcher by pitcher basis. Um, and you can set a specific pitch count limit where it'll pull them so you can say, you know, if he gets to 120, uh, I want to pull after the batter in which he reaches 120. Um, so that sort of overrides this. So, or you can just leave that off and it'll it'll sort of use its own sense. So, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with the AI as I've written it, which tries to do a lot of things. Um, it tries to simulate the error that you're in. So it'll leave a pitcher in a lot longer in 1910 than in 2010, obviously. Um, but then within that scope, you can make these adjustments. Um, and that's, you know, that's trial and error. If you if you set it to this and you think they're still not being left in long enough, you could push it up to a higher number. Uh, good answer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I could just throw one more out there, how about any consideration about team defense? Um, like how they're managed or how the how the well i mean the the, the different different teams different their defenses have different abilities to right. prevent runs right um yeah so i think i talked before about if you have a batter and a pitcher and you're sort of using the stats to figure out whether or not it's a hit um i think i sort of should have put hit in quotes um so it will it will decide if something's a ground out and it will decide if something's a ground ball single, for example. So there's a number of categories that the, that the batter pitcher interface can say, well, this is a, this is going to be a line drive to the outfield. And then it checks, then it checks the defense. Um, and that's, that's generally done in the way of a good above average fielders will take balls that would, uh, that would normally be hits and turn them into outs. And then the reverse is true for, for weaker fielders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, makes sense. Okay, I've got a few more questions here, but just to be cognizant on time, I just want to um, give a couple quick updates on a couple things. One, uh, Derek and I have reached out to find out when we have to have due dates and stuff regarding what we might do in Chicago uh, as a committee in that, and they told us uh, we're a bit ahead of the curve and they'll let us know. 
uh, and really didn't give us any dates. Um, and the other thing is, uh, watch your email. I know I got some emails on it with some things they want to change to the Constitution, um, adding some more people to the board and that. So if you haven't seen that, maybe check your spam and stuff. Um, you know, uh, some interesting, some interesting stuff there. Um, I know we start losing people after, after an hour and we're just getting there. So, um, I'm going to stay, you know, as long as people want to stay and clay, uh, is willing to stay and, and ask, answer questions. But I do know some of you have other, uh, other things to do. I mean, on the East coast, it's probably go to bed and on the West coast where I am, it's probably eat dinner. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so uh, Matthew's wondering, where do you get your projection data for tweaking your models to the newest season? Um, I think at the, you know, I'm mostly, uh, so I have my own projection calculations based on recent seasons. Um, and then every year around March, I will usually get, oh, uh, sort of Davenport or Steamer from something like Fangraphs and sort of double check them against what I have. Um, and sometimes I'll, anyway, sometimes I'll sort of fold it in as, as waiting, waiting what other people think versus waiting what my own al algorithms are. Um, and over the years, I've actually put more weight on what other people think because they put they put a lot more effort into projecting players than I do. Okay. Uh, Bart's wondering, uh, he's got a compliment in here too. He says he believes that you were the designer or you are the designer of season ticket baseball. Yep. Um, uh, which he believe, which he thinks is a great game. What's the future of the game? Uh, more printed seasons or a computer version or what's happening? Um, let's see for a second. For anyone who doesn't know what he's talking about, it's this right here, um, which is a card and dice baseball game. Uh, these are the dice. <laughs> um, so I've sort of gone backwards, right? You look at the history of, uh, of baseball simulations over the last 70 years, and they probably start with something like Stratomatic and move on to, uh, or Weaver, Tony La Russa, baseball mogul, um, et cetera. Um, but with all the data and with my love of card and dice games, um, and with the fact that I already know some people that are interested in these games, thanks to Baseball Mogul, um, I did, uh, over the last few years, I've been building, uh, Season Ticket Baseball, um, which is a card and dice game, as you may have mentioned. I'm just going to show you guys a card, maybe, um, sure. I, I, I just was frustrated with games like Strat and so on, um, mostly because it was just, uh, one of it is I had eye surgery and the numbers are so small in their cards. So I wanted to build some cards that were bigger, but that really wasn't the heart of it. The heart of it was just, I couldn't get people to play with me because it was, it was a complicated game. Um, I myself even had trouble sort of understanding the rules sometimes. Uh, things were... Things were slow and complicated that I thought could be faster, but I thought I could make them faster without sacrificing realism. Uh, and so I put a lot of work into uh, making a game that was easy to learn how to play, um, but also sort of not frustrating to play and yet has a lot of realism. Um, I can give you a super quick summary of the game, which is that you roll a six-sided die and two ten-sided dice to create a number between 100 and 699. So the red die is the hundreds, and then the white is the tens, and the blue is the single digits. If it's a number between 100 and 299, you look on the picture card. Um, if it's between 300 and 499, you look on the batter card. And then we've actually, if it's uh, above 500, you look at the second die to decide uh, which field we'd look at. So 510, the one means you look at the pitcher's defense. 520 to 29, two means you look at the catcher's defense. So here we see, uh, I don't know how clear that is. That's Willie Mays card with the uh, defense table in the upper corner. Um, so a roll between 580 and 589 tells you to look at the defense. So. So the goal was to make it so that the results are on the cards, pitcher, batter, D 
defense as opposed to sort of a bunch of uh, reference sheets that you're always looking at based on defensive ratings and so on. And then rolls of 600 or higher appear on the stadium card, 1986 Fenway Park. Uh, and there's the rolls of 600 or higher. Um, and the results are pretty easy to understand. Uh, 1B is a single, 2B is a double. There's some extra notation for uh, whether you can score from second on a single, whether you can uh, take an extra base, but, but that's sort of a reasonably quick summary. Um, to answer the actual question, the 1950 pre-printed cards are available for sale from our site right now. Uh, 1986 should be arriving today. <laughs> um, 1975 have been sent to the printers. Um, so for people who don't know, the uh, if you look at the screen I am sharing, uh, I have PDF seasons available from 1950 to 2022. Um, and the PDF seasons uh, have six players per sheet, and you can buy some uh, pre-perforated cardstock on Amazon, print them on your home computer, and that's exactly what I did to get cards like this. So, so in your own house, you can actually get some pretty nice looking cards, um, but it is also a hassle to print your own cards, and so I'm trying to make, trying to get them printed um, as quickly as I can, which sort of depends on getting them formatted properly, uh, and to some degree depends on revenue. If I sell a lot of sets of 1986, I can use that money to buy sets of 1975 and so on. Okay, you you dice and card guys, um, I am just amazed at, at this. I have never played card and dice, uh, ball strat or anything. I think I've mentioned that before being up here in way North Canada. Um, uh, I look at this stuff and I go, you guys are hardcore. Um, <laughs> quite possibly at one of the conventions, you're going to have to tie me down and play. Uh, I don't know if it'll be Chicago with the Blue Jays in town for part of that convention. So uh, anyway. Um, that doesn't take up your whole time, right? What, going to the games? Yeah. Well, uh, we'll figure that out. Um, <laughs> you know, I live in Northern BC. I mean, the closest team I got, Seattle, and that's about 12-hour drive. So um Okay, so Tim's asking, what about RetroSheet as a data source since uh, Lawman is not updated soon enough or using MLB who updated every day? Um, any thoughts about how you might be able to retrieve that stuff? Um, I It's funny, I'm using RetroSheet to try to update the, uh, the schedule. So I think, I don't know which seasons I showed you, but I, I have the... the the correct schedule for sort of every season since like 2002 and then some of the historical seasons. And so I'm trying to fill in the gaps. Um, so that's where RetroSheet really helps. Um, just in terms of sort of where my tools are, it's easier for me to, to like cut and paste the 2022 stats from fan graphs and add them to my data than it is to write tools that would, um, that would scrape RetroSheet since I already have sort of an existing database that's that's similar to Laman. Um, so I'm glad the data source is there and I've used it somewhat, but I haven't yet gotten good enough at sort of going into RetroSheet and turning it into the kind of data, the sort of season by season data that I'm using and presenting to people. Um, and I do occasionally have people say, hey, you should make it so that if it's July 13th, I can download the stats from MLB and, and have the exact up to the date uh, stats in the game. Um, I think OOTP might offer that option. That's a lot of work um, that focuses on sort of a very small subset of the people who would play the game, which is people who just care about like that one day in that current season. Um, so that's not, that's not been high on the, on the feature list. Okay. Rick, Rick's mentioned he's going to leave in a few minutes and uh, just wanted to give you a compliment. He's really enjoyed it. Uh, you're talking that he's just uh, picked up APBA again and uh, a couple of years ago, I think during the pandemic after a 40 year break and he's really hardcore. Um, Joseph's wondering, uh, what does your player skill aging model look like in rough terms? Um. In rough terms, I've actually oversimplified things a little bit. So, um, well, you know, I, there's probably a blog article I could point you to, um, but there's uh, 
So I'm going into the editor here for the player that I happen to have up um, just because I can show you that I have, oh, where is it? Uh, um, another maybe a um, additional question to that is uh, players retiring. They don't yeah. retire always when they do in real life, correct? Right. Um, so here I'm looking at at Dykstra and it lists a number of stats that are related to his age. The first one is projected debut, which says 1986. That's because we started the game in 1986. So, so the game thinks that he debuted in 1986. So that's sort of wrong. Um, but you know, it at least shows you that if it was a minor league player, it would it would have a sense of when it thought he was going to be ready for the majors. Uh, it thinks he's going to retire around 96. Peak start means that he, when he gets to age 25, he will sort of be at his peak, and then he will stay there until age 31, uh, and then he will begin to decline. So whenever you start the game, it generates these two numbers randomly and says sort of he will improve until he gets to this first number, then he will flatten out. And then when he gets to the second number, he will start to decline. Uh, so you sort of just have a simple three line graph, um, but there's a lot of randomness thrown in, there's injuries and so on, but at a high level, uh, and I think you might've seen, I had to go into commissioner mode uh, in order to view this. So if you're, if you're playing the game and you, and you sort of don't wanna cheat, then don't don't do that. Don't look at these numbers. Just play and look at the stats, and you'll know that sort of under the under the hood, uh, it might you know this this number might be 28. So you might start the game and see that when he turns 28, he starts getting worse. Um, and a lot of that's based on this on the data that I have. Um, but if you play the game into the future, which is one part I hadn't mentioned, if you play until 2030, and now you're just looking at uh, fictional players then obviously there's a lot of randomness there and you have to you have to guess how things are going. So that's that's sort of the high level view of the aging. Um, yeah, it figures out where they are on draft day, uh, looks at their career stats to figure out what sort of their peak years were, and then creates pretty much a linear acceleration towards that point. Uh, then they roughly stay there and then they actually decline exponentially. Um, so, does that make some sense? Yep. So I'm guessing uh, if they don't retire on time, Nolan Ryan's still pitching and just threw his 12th no hitter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I've got all the I got all the questions that were put in the chat. Again, I'll open it up here if anybody wants to ask Clay something. Just uh, there you go. There's Ryan. That's a lot of that's a lot of seasons. <laughs> Yeah, so he's in the, was, oh, you know what? I've actually, I've got a setting on right now where it loads his entire career. So even though we were playing the 1986 season, uh, we can see all of his future stats. <laughs> so anyway. Um, I was wondering, does Nolan Ryan then skew your the profile for when a player matures and when a player um starts to deteriorate uh i mean in his case it'll load the stats and then it will pick a yeah then it'll it will set hit it will set the year at which he declines um later oh wrong one. <laughs> oh, I, didn't play exactly people. Oh, I forgot to mention um yeah so i mentioned the peak start and peak end um and then potential is actually a measure of how quickly they accelerate before they hit their peak. And then longevity is a measurement of how slowly they decline. And so in this case, the league average is 100. So he's 33% better in terms of keeping his stats up after the end. Um, but in this league, it's not, it's not replay mode. It's, uh, it's random. So he's, you know, he's unfortunately been saddled with uh, being relatively average in that regard. Um, but he's 39 and he's still an 88. So, you know, he will, he will push the limits to some degree. Okay. Mix throwing one in here. Uh, he's really happy you've done this and thanking you for showing up. Um, is there a summary somewhere of all the features documented anywhere that uh, they can take a look at? I do have, let's see. 
You know, it's funny. Um, now that I have a printed rule book for season ticket, I keep thinking that baseball mogul needs a printed rule book. Um, it should be a little bit time consuming, but it sure would have be nice to have it sitting next to you. Let's see. Oh, that's not right. I was trying to bring up the help files. Do, do, do. Um, these are the help files that you can access in game. Uh, welcome, playing the game. Uh, teams, players, different menus. So there's a lot of pages that do a pretty good job of describing how the stuff works. Um, there is a URL where you can access that, but I'm having trouble accessing it right now. So maybe I'll send that out to you guys afterwards. <laughs> right now I'm getting this when I go looking at help files. My wife is my, uh, is my webmaster, so I'll have to ask her why the help files are not showing up. Personally, I think your wife's absolutely amazing to uh, to allow you to uh, pers pursue writing and playing games your whole life. Yeah. I mean, it paid the bills pretty well for a while and still does. Um, but yeah, I mean, she she definitely supported the first iteration. Uh, would not have been able to do that without her that was those first couple of years. Um, and then for many years, she was the screen artist. Um, the bookkeeper. <laughs> uh, we tackled customer support together, which is mostly people send us emails and they have trouble installing the game or they, you know, they have questions like these. Um, so if it's if it's technical, she answers it. And if it's baseball, she forwards it to me. Oh, that's great to see you working together on it. Okay, again, uh, open any questions, any comments? I've got one for you. Okay. Uh, back to the Years you were with Stormfront. Um, I'm a big fan of the, uh, or uh, <laughs> spent a good portion of my teenage years playing the Larusa games and uh, old time baseball. Uh, so just curious, I guess what um, what portions of those games that you uh, worked on? Oh, uh, what portions you said? Yes. Um, A little bit of all of them, although I think most of my work uh, was in sort of the statistical simulation side on um, when I was added to the team on Tony 2 and then Tony 3. Um, and so that was sort of the season long play and then uh, different historical seasons. Um, but boy, I had, you know, we had, if there was a bug report of a, uh, we had a great bug once. Um, <clears throat> where the outfielder would catch the ball. I think it was probably a, it's very easy in programming to switch negative and positive numbers. Um, and so a center fielder would catch a fly ball and then he would take it and he would animate and throw the ball into the stands. So he was throwing it exactly away from home plate. So he was supposed to be throwing it to home plate and he, was th and he threw it away. Uh, that might have only taken an hour to find and fix, but that's that's one of the bugs I remember. Um, so, you know, I worked on animations. I remember having to deal with color palettes back in the day when, uh, you know, video cards only had 256 colors. Um, and so you could choose what those colors were. And so you'd go to the artist, get the palette, put them in. Uh, and obviously, if there was a mistake, everything looked really, really, really bad. Um, but dealing with... Uh, you know, dealing with some of the low level programming of the transparencies and the animations and so on. Um, a fair bit of the AI, you know, which base people threw to and so on when you're playing against the computer. Right. Um, I think it's funny, I was working with two guys at the time. I think I, so, so Derek, I think you might have asked me about Phil King and James Grove at some point, they had worked on the ESPN products at the time, which was, which was sort of an iter, it was, they took the Tony game and they, and they changed it in some ways to, to meet the publisher. I forget who the publisher was. Um, the Baseball but, Tonight yeah. game? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Baseball Tonight. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, but I don't know. I don't think ESPN published it. I don't know who did. I don't think it was EA. Um, anyway, uh, uh, Phil was, both of them actually knew some of the computer stuff better than I did. And I knew some of the baseball stuff 
better than they did. So they would come over and and ask me about, uh, you know, where players should throw the ball or where they should position themselves or what the effect of playing the infield in was. I think we had that option on only three. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd work with them on that and they'd solve my palate problems <laughs> for me. So you, you've worked with a team of how many at Stormfront and then on Baseball Mogul, you're, uh, you know, pretty much a, a pretty small team there. You know, I, I don't know, besides you and your wife, if anybody, uh, uh, works on the product at all, but um, what, what's your feeling on having the, the two different, you know, the not quite a lone wolf situation, but versus having, you know, uh, 10 people doing graphics and, and this many people doing sound effects and so forth. Right. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember at Stormfront, I think we had 10 programmers um, in the entire company and maybe 1994, because I remember at one point I sort of counted and counted the artists. Um, but we had people working on a Dungeons and Dragons game, Eagle Eye Mysteries. Um, we probably had three people dedicated to baseball at that point. Um, but we were working on two different games. Um, and we sort of had three and a half, like uh, Hudson and uh, Mark B, Mark Bucanani, who'd written the first Tony LaRusso one, were, were still at the company. They were in sort of technical director management roles. And so they were they were spreading their time around. Um, I certainly, I mean, I, those guys are two of my best friends um, still. So I, we loved that environment. Um, and it was, and it was great that, uh, you know, they had some technical skills that I didn't have. And I had some baseball skills and, you know, it was mentioned that I wrote, I wrote a baseball game when I was five. I, you know, I did, it was three, it was three six-sided dice. I actually moved from London to California when I was five years old. And my dad was a huge baseball fan and he took me to some games and I just was obsessed. Uh, and so, uh, and I was, whatever, I was very good at math at that age. Um, and so I sat down and made the stuff and showed it to my dad. And I think even he thought it was just sort of too complicated for him. And, and so we'd sit down and play. I think we had a copy of Long Ball. Uh, we had a copy of the Catico game with the spinners, Catico All-Star. Um, so we had games in the house, but I, you know, when he wasn't around, I would write my own games. Um, but in terms of, in terms of programmers, that was, you know, that was, I enjoyed having more people to work with. Um, 10 years ago, Baseball Mogul was actually making a bit more money. Uh, I had a consulting gig working for a company in Korea um, on one of their baseball games. And that brought in enough money that I had, that I paid myself and I had a programmer and I had a full-time artist. Uh, so programmer was a guy named Ian Smith who wrote a lot of the stuff that's in Baseball Mogul now. A lot of those, a lot of those cut and paste tools for exporting stats and so on, uh, he was able to figure out. Uh, he understood Windows programming a lot better than I did. He did all those graphics animations. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's probably a sweet spot. I think I was enjoying it the most when we had four people in the company. Um, I had a college student who wrote to me and said he wanted to be an intern. Um, and so I brought him in one summer. And then as soon as he graduated, we hired him. That was a guy named Connor, if anyone's worked with our company before. Um, and he's now writing, he's now teaching people how to program for a living. Um, but, uh, you know that was that was a good group it was nice having those people there but it is at the same time the lone wolf thing takes a lot of the pressure off i don't have to worry about whatever payroll forms for employees and health insurance and things like that right it it uh, it simplifies things so uh, i think baseball mogul is not improving as much every year as it was back when i had uh ian working with me and i had an artist um but my lifestyle's fine. <laughs> so, so well, yeah, that, I guess you also, you don't have the added pressure of, uh, I'm sure with storefront and, and most of those companies that there are certain target, you know, dates for releasing games and you have to hit it by a certain day in order to have it shipped in time for, you know, Christmas and all, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think, um, so you mentioned that I, I think you mentioned football and possibly basketball. I haven't really done anything in the basketball realm professionally i'd love to make a game at some point but uh <laughs> you know there's too many other things to do uh but there is a game called football mogul that i come out with every at the beginning of every nfl season football mogul 
23, I forget what we called it. Well, the, the, the numbering scheme, I think, matches Madden so that people don't get confused. Um, but there's a very similar game for American professional football um, that I release around Labor Day of every year. Um, last year in July, I had a retinal detachment. Uh, and so I had to go in for surgery and then I had to lie down for a month and all these other things. Uh, and I just mentioned that because I sent an email out to the to the thousands of people on my mailing list that just said football will not be released on Labor Day. You know, like I'll, I'll release it when I get around to it. Um, and it's it's really it's it's actually really nice having people who bought the game before having a relatively small customer base that people just write back and say, you know, great, like I'll buy it when it comes out. Uh, hope your eye gets better. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a good community, but yeah, I didn't have that pressure of, of, uh, hitting deadlines the same way. Okay. I got a couple things here in the chat. I, I am going to point out though, the CFL game is better. Um, you know, we need one less down and we got bigger balls. Um, Matthew has, uh, put in here, uh, the link to the manual. Yeah. And that's great. Am I sharing um, that screen right now? I think. Yeah. Warren yeah. is wondering when you started have when you had you started your eight hundred number. Where did you uh, market the game for people to find it? Um. Uh, it was the USA Today publication. Was it Sports Weekly? I think it was Baseball Weekly. Yeah, it might have been Baseball Weekly, depending on when you started it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, ninety-seven maybe. Um, had some ads in there. Um. Computer Gaming World was a print magazine at the time. Um, and the first version of Baseball Mogul was uh, was named the Sports Game of the Year. In Computer Gaming World, it's actually an award that it's shared with a, a Formula One racing game. Um, but that obviously got us a lot of press. Um, and I remember after that, I bought some ads in Computer Gaming World and that led to, uh, led to some calls. Um, so I think it was mostly sort of like one one baseball outlet and one game outlet. Um, and eventually Micro Center picked us up. Uh, so one one retail outlet with stores in some places. Um, anyway, that and that then led to a weird a company, a publisher named WizardWorks, which had made a game called, I think, Deer Hunter that had become really popular because uh, people love shooting deer on their computers in the late 90s. Um, picked up Baseball Mogul and published it for a couple of years. And so that actually got it in stores. Um, and then, uh, all right, I won't say anything negative about them, but we, the WizardWorks relationship didn't end well, uh, but by then it was early 2000s and the net was growing and we could have a website and either ship people a CD or think it's beginning to get to the point where they could download the game. Okay. It looks like I, I, uh, I froze there for a minute. Um, Mike <laughs> says he remembers buying it at a shopping mall uh, many, many years ago. I think actually I, I recall buying it. I have no idea where my copy is, but that would have been in the 1990s as well. Yep. Um, open it up again for the last time. Uh if anybody's got anything. So you were talking about how you you don't understand sort of the strat card and dice people. I think it's really interesting to compare um, to compare computer simulations versus card and dice. Because people will ask all these questions like, well, how do you manage pitchers? The cool thing about card and dice is like the rules for when a pitcher gets taken out of the game or something like that you know, the, the rules for how often people get injured and so on, you can, you can literally see it all, uh, right? Here we've got, you know, the injury table. Um, the, the amount of complaints that I get with Baseball Mogul where people write in and say, like, I think your game's broken because all my players are getting injured. Um, and, you know, I can show that, you know, they'll be like, you cheated. Like, I was in the World Series against the, you know, against the Yankees and, Pedro Martinez broke his leg and I lost. And, and they'll sort of think that like, I put in some code to cheat against them so I could win. Um, I very much didn't, but if you can't prove it to someone when the code is 150,000 lines. Um, on the card and dice side, if people wanna know 
you know, you know that the, you know that if you if you roll an injury, uh, or you you know give up a walk off home run, like it's it's there on the cards. You, the, nobody's cheating against you. You can see it all, um, and it, and it helps answer a lot of the questions of sort of, um, you know, people want to know how things are simulated, like what the chances are. You could you know it'll it'll take a little bit of time, but you can pull up the card and a calculator and say, oh, so Manny Ramirez has a twenty four percent chance of getting a hit against Roger Clemens, like. You can do the math if you want to, um, but with uh, on the sim side, uh, you know I'm doing the math and I'm trying to be as fair as possible. But I think people sometimes get frustrated that it's that it's hidden. Yeah, no, I'm I'm amazed by the card and card and dice. I mean, it's not a lot that I see, I've seen up here in Canada, um, and and uh, I look forward to Chicago, where where hopefully we're going to have some demonstrations of this. Um, you know, as long as, the, as long as it's not when the Jays are playing. Um, but, uh, you know, we've already had a, a previous uh, uh, programmer talking to us about his game and how he, uh, he did cheat it against the Jays because they beat his team in 92 or 93. Oh, no. um, yeah. Yeah. He, I, obviously he was joking, but, uh, but he, he did make that comment and I think we have it on tape somewhere. Uh, anyone else got any more questions? Uh, a few other things. Um, Matt, you'd be happy if you coded, uh, the Yankees as bottom feeders, he says in the nineties, but you know, you could code them there permanently for a lot of people. Um, and it's then really again, I mean, you probably know. could do the same thing for the Red Sox and there'd be happy people in New York. Yeah. Um, you, you know, can, uh... so, uh, yeah. open up here, folks, anybody got anything they want to say? We're getting to six 30, which is. Usually when we end up ending. <laughs> it's really easy. And I can just hit this minus button and just knock him down to, you know. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to interject then. Clay, are you still, do you still have ties out here in Connecticut? Oh, uh, oh, you're in, uh, you're in Hartford, aren't you? Yes. Okay. Um my dad lives in Salisbury, um, and we still have friends in sort of the eastern half of the state. So we lived in Mansfield and Ashford um, from 2004 to 2016. Ah. 2018. 2018. <laughs> yes. Okay. We moved to Hartford in 2007. Okay. So. Uh, and my wife has i have no siblings my wife has four siblings and they're all in massachusetts um we met at wellesley high school just outside boston um and then i went to college at wesleyan in connecticut um and yeah basically when we wanted to when we wanted to start sports mogul actually i think it was called infinite monkey systems at the time but when we wanted to start the company that would make baseball mogul um we sort of knew we couldn't afford to live in Marin County, which is where we were at the time. Um, you know, just living off one income and trying to make a game and and so on. Um, and so we went back to Middletown, which was a place that we, anyway, we knew where all the cheap restaurants were and we knew, <laughs> we yeah. knew where we could find a place to live. Uh, and so that worked out pretty well. So, so it looks like Dixie's concurring that uh, you can really uh, drop that whole New York down about as far as low as it'll go. Um, being she lives about a mile from uh, Fenway. Awesome. Um, one person here is uh, wondering if you can download the season ticket rules and demo teams from your website. Or I guess they're saying you can download it. Yes. I more of a comment, folks. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean... Technically, the game's free in that you can get all the rules. You can get um, the two 75 World Series teams, the two 86 World Series teams. Uh, you can tell I'm a Red Sox fan based on which teams I, I make available for free. Um, even though, well, yeah, neither of those World Series were great for Red Sox fans, but I guess that's why I want people to play them so they can, so they can fix history. Um, and... Yeah, so all the, you know, you can get the stadium card, you can print on cardstock, you can print it on a piece of paper. Um, there, I think, so the full rule book, which is 40 pages with 
injury tables and an example of play in the back. Uh, you know, a whole lot of information that you don't necessarily need. Um, and then you can also download something called the basic rules, which is two pages. Uh, so if you want to spend ink and paper for about, I don't know, 10 to 15 pages of stuff. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, yeah. So like I mentioned I... that there's very few lookup tables. There's a quick start chart, which you don't even, you know, people who've played Strat or App, but don't don't even read the rules. They sort of just pick up this and it tells them how to play. Uh, you know, that's how you get a number. The places you look up the number. Um, and then there's one card for strategies, offensive strategies on the front, defensive on the back. And so those are uh, bunts, hit and run. Uh, bringing in the infield, guarding the lines, holding the runner, and then the steal attempts are actually on the quick start card. So it's pretty easy to get started. Okay, uh, it looks like I owe Dixie a huge apology. Dixie is a he, not a she, uh, like <laughs> Dixie Walker with an L and Dixie Howe. Uh, All right, my, my humble apologies. Uh, when everybody's screen is out. Um, I have to make some assumptions, so I I do apologize. Yeah, and I'm I'm not great with pronouns. <laughs> As the world has changed, and I warned my students of that the first day of class. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we're, I th I think we're gonna end it here. What do you think, Derek? Yeah, no, that was great. I, uh, Clay, really appreciate coming on and uh, talking about uh, all, all of your games. Um, so, um, and uh, I'm pretty sure everybody got something out of this. And, you know, we got a lot, a lot of questions answered. So, um, and uh, I'm having a, I'm having a blast with Mogul. Um, I started with the 61 Angels and I'm up to about 1982. Okay. Uh, and it took me about the same amount of time as it did them to get to the playoffs. So even even though I have the advantage of knowing, you know, all these players, you know, who, who's going to be great uh, with the amateur draft and everything, um, it it didn't matter. <laughs> I still struggled. Um, and uh, uh, like I said, with the with some of the randomization, um, I had you know folks like Steve Carlton that I drafted, and uh, he pitched pretty poorly for me. Uh, I went ahead and traded him, and he, all of a sudden he became Steve Carlton. Yeah. So, uh, but it's it's a lot of fun. I, I you know, I, I kind of uh, pick and choose a lot of my favorite angels to get onto the team. So, um, but it, it's a blast when you're playing through all these seasons and um, the the amount of variation. So it's not you know you you don't get everything uh, you know that you would expect from certain players. So. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Clay. Um, I'm not sure if you're still a Sabre member. Um, if you're not, come back. Yeah, and you know what? I actually, I, I let it lapse. I never got around to going to any meetings. And so I figured I, I didn't need to, to do it. Um, but I'm now starting to think, and I never got to a national convention either. Um, but, you know, my daughter's, my daughter has left the nest, um, <laughs> which, which makes life a lot a lot easier. It was just one kid, but I, I still spend a lot of time in dad mode, driving friends around and stuff and so on. But that's oh, I, uh, now I'm just down to a dog and some cats and it's easier. Yeah, I, I get that. Uh, except I've had two, two daughters. Um, yeah, it's in Chicago this year, um, which, which is always fun, I guess. I don't know. I've, I've only been a member for about three, four years. Um, and Derek and I have uh, uh, tried to reinvigorate. I can't say the word get this thing going again in this uh, research area. Yeah, you can and, say invigorate. Uh, I've definitely noticed. Um, yeah, anyway, like Derek contacted me and a couple other people were like, hey, there's a Sabre group or there's a the Sim group. So there's definitely some energy here. Um, are you guys, I mean, the interesting thing about simulations is is they can be used for research uh, in, the, in the context of like writing a Sabre article, right? You might want to Anyway, there's there's hundreds of different reasons you'd want that. Then, of course, there's the entertainment value. Um, I mean, does the Sabre group... I, I know Derek has a strong interest in sort of the history of all the games out there, uh, you know, so it's nice to be able to contribute 
some info about the about the entertainment side of things. Um, but do you have um, folks that are trying to sort of write simulations or use simulations for certain things? We've 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 had a couple of people say they're working on writing some stuff. I personally have been using a simulation. Uh, I'm still trying to. I got to push myself to get more of it done. But I took Tom Stone's book that was written a couple of years ago, uh, figuring out, and he used war as sort of the basis as the best lineups for every team ever. Yeah. Uh, and uh, using OOTP, I've imported them all, created the rosters, the whole bit. Using the current playoff structure, uh, trying to simulate probably be 118 seasons and see what the results come out to be. Uh, I did it based on last year's schedule. Uh, but, you know, I thought the results were just so wacky considering that, you know, teams in their own division played each other 18 times. Um, I've modified it now that actually they play uh, every team in both leagues, six games, three home, three away. So it's a okay. slightly longer schedule. Uh, my hope is to get it done and I'm creating a giant database. Um, or a couple databases. The nice part is then, uh, then I can say it's uh, some professional development for work because uh, using these databases and the statistic analysis, et cetera. Um, but ultimately I wanna share the results, um, you know, under the, the, under the guise that who's the best franchise ever, right. which really all, it, all it's going to do is uh, help the discussion around the, uh, the bar when people are having a few pops. Um, because everybody's going to say their team's the best. Um, so anyway, it's it's some neat research I've been doing uh, with the new playoff structure. I'm seeing some really interesting things. Yeah. Um, but but I, I'm, a, I'm a little ways away. I need to, uh, I basically need to go away for a month and just simulate stuff. Yeah, I was going to show you the, uh, the feature in Baseball Mogul that loads the best players from each franchise, but I'm sort of in the middle of development. And so that that part's broken. <laughs> um but yeah it's one of the sort of quick start options at the front is you it's called all-time all-stars and there's an excel file well a csv file in the game that lists the ids of of sort of my selection of the best players although actually a lot of a lot of people on the forums have volunteered their own suggestions over the years uh but those players are there and you can edit the file if you want um and then you can play them all against each other well, it's funny because Tom says, you know, he gets it from everybody. No, well, how did you pick this guy instead of this guy? Like, you know, obviously for the Jays, I'm like, how can John Olerud not be on that team? And, right. uh, and he's not, but, you know, it's not going to be here or there because uh, in a couple of seasons, you know, Vladdy's going to be the the top first baseman of the team unless something dramatic happens there. So yeah. anyway, um, I, I think lots of us could sit and talk ball all night, but uh, uh, I got supper going here somewhere. Okay. The boss, the boss has got it on. So um, Derek, I'm going to, you're co-hosting. I'm going to uh, leave it up to you to close it down tonight. Okay. Yeah, no, sounds good. Yeah. If it, um, unless anybody else has any questions, I, I guess we can wrap it here. Um, but uh, yeah, I appreciate again, Clay, I uh, appreciate you coming on and talking about all your games with us um, and uh, everybody for uh, all their questions. I guess if there's anything, that we missed or forgot. Um, I guess I, I can guess it's Clay if there's something uh, that, that we forgot to ask. But, uh, sure, I'm around. <laughs> great. I think Appreciate we can find it. you. Okay, yeah. cool. Thanks, everybody. All right, guys. Well, thanks again. Everybody take care. Have a good night.